Hi, I'm Ed Chung. Again, I have been years for the last year and a half. I'm also an internal medicine physician, making a series of videos here. And this is video two of eight, in which I'm going to sort of try to define Meniere's. Um, by all means, there are tons and tons and tons of information here on the internet. You can Google Meniere's disease. There's some great references. I actually um, put a little reference on the description of this video um, for the two references that I think are actually probably pretty good or the best um, for defining and what Meniere's disease is. But what I'm going to try to do here is explain, maybe in more layman terms, also with the physician's terms and uh, technical terms, as far as what Meniere's disease actually is. Now, the first thing I do want to say is there's a difference between a disease and a syndrome, okay? Meniere's can be described in both categories. Now, the difference between the two is that um, a disease is a actual abnormal pathological finding or dysfunction of a body part or organ system. Okay, for example, if someone has heart disease or cardiovascular disease, what this is is a known buildup of plaque or atherosclerosis in the arteries that feed the organ, causing lack of blood flow and causing a bunch of symptoms and possible damage to the organ. Okay, so there's an actual disease there. Versus a syndrome like chronic fatigue syndrome is a constellation or group of consistent symptoms or findings that that as of yet do not does not have a definitive pathological or hard evidence cause or reason for this for the symptoms. So Meniere's is actually a disease in that we actually do sort of have a pathological finding. However, at the same time, it causes a variable amount of symptoms, and so it can actually be fit in two categories of both a disease and a syndrome. Okay, so by all means, look up what Meniere's disease is on the web and get the more real formal definition. But what I'm going to go through here is um, what I what I describe as it would define as the Meniere's. Um, I'm going to start out with actually a, a little summary here that I'm going to read um, from one of the many physicians that I've seen, and this physician actually has seen multiple, multiple Meniere's and treats multiple Meniere's patients. Um, and here's his little description. In general, Meniere's syndrome is named after Prosper Meniere, who described the condition over 150 years ago. At that time, most doctors did autopsies on their patients to determine what caused their problems. Meniere's, Dr. Meniere's, looked at the inner ears of his patients who had died. He found that some of his patients had developed too much pressure in the inner ear fluid. When alive, these patients experienced episodes of noise, pressure, fullness, and decreased hearing in one ear associated with vertigo, the feeling that they or the room was spinning. These episodes would last 30 minutes to half a day. The vertigo caused nausea and vomiting, and sometimes loss of controls of bowel or bladder. These episodes came at interval, ir irregular intervals. At the beginning, the noise and hearing loss would go away between attacks. However, with time, many patients experienced permanent hearing loss and noise in the ear that usually got worse during an attack. Dr. Meniere named Meniere syndrome, named it Meniere syndrome. A syndrome is, a, again, a group of cause, a signs or symptoms that occur together. For Meniere's syndrome, the signs or symptoms are hearing loss in one ear, noise in one ear, fullness or pressure in one ear, and vertigo. And about 10% of patients with Meniere's syndrome have it in both ears. And for these patients, unfortunately, not a lot can be done. Again, the cause of Meniere's syndrome is still sort of un, uh, is caused by this build by fluid. However, um, in 150 years since Dr. Meniere's named this condition, no one has been able to figure out what causes the fluid pressure to get too high and cause these attacks. S even today, the only sure test that is positively proves that a person has Meniere's syndrome is an autopsy. So, um, also if the hearing loss is low, is a low tone loss that, that improves with attacks, this is more characteristic of the condition. Because Meniere's syndrome can look like other inner ear disorders, it's very important to do other testings um, to order, in order to make sure you don't have another cause for these symptoms. Okay, so again, uh, this actually is a disease um, versus a syndrome. However, the only way to truly formally diagnose the, the quote disease is actually doing an autopsy and cutting out the inner ear and looking at your inner ear complex. So let me go through my little definition of what Meniere's is. Um, again, it is a disease, and it's caused by dysfunction of the inner ear. 
Now here is your hearing, or inner, here's your, your, your whole ear, ear hearing complex, okay? And the way this works is sound comes in through this side, through your ear, goes through the outer ear. Okay, so this, this is the outer ear. Sound comes in, goes through the outer ear, hits the ear canal. The sound waves reverberate, go through the different bones, okay? And as it goes through the different bones, it, the bones translate that wave pattern into, from the middle, middle, middle ear area, to the inner ear complex. So your inner ear complex is what is dysfunctional in Meniere's disease, okay? In the inner ear, you have your cochlea, which is your hearing, okay? And you have your vestibular complex, which is your balance. Both these complexes are hooked up to your eighth nerve, which comes out of the brainstem and through the base of the skull, okay? And it's right next to the seventh nerve, which controls your face movements and your facial, facial taste, uh, tasting and um, other, other things of your face. Okay. So with this, with this um, Meniere's disease, what happens is the inner ear, okay, not the outer, not the middle or the outer ear, okay, not not the hearing area, not the inner, the middle ear, and not the but the inner ear, you have a dysfunction of too much fluid in there. Um, the middle ear dysfunction. If you have middle ear dysfunction, you can also have um, inner ear dysfunction. So, for example, let's say you fly on an airplane, okay, and, or you go swimming, your ear gets plugged up, you fly on an airplane, your whole <coughs> middle ear area gets filled with fluid, okay, or you're coming down, what happens is this eustachian tube, which helps let the air pressurize and equalize, gets blocked, and you have a cold. If this middle ear area gets completely blocked, it can push in on the inner ear area and cause vertigo, hearing loss, fullness, and the same symptoms as Meniere's disease. But Meniere's disease is actual dysfunction of the inner ear complex, which is right here. Okay, and what happens is with this inner ear complex is either they don't really know, but they think either one, there's too much fluid being produced in this inner ear complex. Okay, and with too much fluid, the whole thing blows up like a balloon and causes dysfunction. Or number two, there's not enough reabsorption. You're, you're constantly producing fluid in this, in this inner ear complex, but you're not absorbing it back. Or three, there's some kind of damage to the way this complex sort of drains. Um, if you look at these two windows there, the, the, some of the fluid does sort of leak out or drain out so that the pressure doesn't build up too, too high. So it's unclear exactly what it is, but what happens is that there's too much fluid in the inner ear area. And depending on where in the inner ear the fluid uh, builds up uh, or it causes more and more symptoms. And that's why there's a variability in the symptoms that people get. Okay, So there's two halves of your inner ear complex. You have the vestibular area, which is your balance area, and you have your cochlea, which is your um, hearing complex. So in my next video, I'm going to actually describe the symptoms people get. Um, and and um, describe why people get these symptoms. Thank you.